Right. Well, we are just going to jump right into our discussion. I will introduce each of my speakers as I ask them their first question. Ray, we are going to start with you. This is Ray Fielding from the UK Space Agency, relatively new to the job, so we won't go too hard on him. Um, but I'd like to start off with an overview of the government's approach to this topic, you know, how the UK Space Agency and others that you work with view it. Um, how do you look at fulfilling your duty for oversight and regulation while also very actively promoting a commercial space industry within the United Kingdom? Thank you. Uh, we take three approaches to this, um, to, and to some, they're robust, flexible, and timely, and to take each one of those in turn. The robust approach that we take is we want to be a gold standard regulator. Uh, we've been regulating satellites for, for decades now and have considerable experience of doing so. So we know that our regulations uh, would stand the test of time, robust, and include all of the legislation, both national and international, which they have to do. We've also know that they, um, they, they meet the needs of what we want to do in terms of policy. So we have sustainability assessments built into them. We have safety and security assessments built into them as well. So if you're licensed through the UK, and this just sounds like a sales pitch, but I'll do it anyway. If you're licensed through the UK, you, you know you're getting a stamp of quality uh, which tells your operators and, and, and your investors and your insurance market that uh, you've gone through a, a solid process. You've been really looked at carefully and you've got uh, the, the, the seal of, of approval to, to uh, go forward with, with safe, secure operations, which are also sustainable. The flexible approach that we take as well to do this, because you could be extremely robust, but also stifle the markets. We, we add flexibility in, into that. And there's um, a comedy show in the UK you probably won't be aware of, but uh, they have a sketch in there which is called Computer Says No. And it's all about the, uh, the famous customer service you get in the UK, where a you, you, uh, person comes in and asks to, for help, and then Computer Says No. And we, we need to make sure that we don't have that approach and we can be flexible to the needs, especially new operators, new space, SMEs who come in with concepts, um, con an SME coming in to hit, hit with a wall of regulation. A, a government regulation can be extremely intimidating for them to the point where they might think, well, perhaps not going to space, it looks far too difficult and complex. We have to understand the needs. We have to work with them especially for the, the new technologies which are coming on board, the RPO operations. We've licensed two um, ADR missions, active debris removal missions, and to do that, we've been flexible working with the companies to adapt our policies and regulations to meet their needs. So there's, there's that flexibility we're building into. And there's the speed. Things are happening very, very fast in the mm -hmm. space sector. We have to adapt. I mean, we can be flexible and robust, but if it takes 10 years to do anything, People are going to go elsewhere, and again, we don't get that growth which we're seeking to uh, achieve, in, especially in the, in the UK. It's all about catalyzing investments and growing the space sector. So we need to do things quickly. And to do that, um, for instance, I, I run a lot of innovation programs. I run the National ADR missions, IOSM servicing. And when we commission work, we're currently in phase B for the ADR work. We've built, we've built into that a, a regulation consultation piece right at the start. So we get those conversations moving early. We get the people in the room early. So we understand if we have policy requirements which need to, a flexible approach to policy, we start those conversations and dialogues quickly. Uh, and that means we don't miss the boat, as it were. And we also recognize that the market's changing. So we're consulting with industry and partners all of the time. In fact, we've got a consultation just launching in, in imminently. Uh, where we, we throw out the regulation approach, ask for comments, ask for future needs, ask for feedback, so we work together with the community. So hopefully we can anticipate some of those needs as, as they come forward, allowing us to adapt quickly in, in, in a speedy nature, which is required by our community. Well, I think you kind of teed up something else I wanted to say, which is the consultative nature that we want to get into here. So it's really interesting to hear that that is a priority in the UK, but it's also a priority in our room. So just to remind everybody, we do have a poll that's going to talk about some of these uh, priorities and what they should be and how government should be looking at this. So if you haven't filled that out, please do. We'll be looking at that later. So thank you, Ray, um, for laying out a really um, thorough overview of, of the, the, almost the values that are driving how the UK Space Agency looks at this. 
I want to turn now to Marissa, who is here representing the Space Bureau of the Federal Communications Commission. Obviously, the United States has a really complex uh, regulatory environment for space companies. Can you share a little bit about the history of the Space Bureau, why it was created, and your sort of views on the overall <coughs> approach that the United States is taking to this issue? Um, particularly, I'm interested in hearing, you know, how do you coordinate with entities um, within the U.S. government to actually ensure that we have a clear regulatory environment for various space companies? Sure. Um, so I'll start by just giving a little bit of um, background on the FCC's role in some of these issues. Um, and the FCC is the regulator for communications in, in the United States, um, including communications with satellites. Um, and the FCC reviews um, the, as part of its regulation of non-government, so including commercial satellites, the FCC reviews the orbital debris mitigation plans associated with those satellites or systems um, in its application process. And so that's been um, a little bit of the role of the FCC um, to date in some of the, the topics discussed um, during this event. Um, in April of this year, um, the uh, FCC chairwoman announced uh, the launch of the Space Bureau within the FCC, um, which had, has now taken on some of the functions that had previously been uh, part of the International Bureau and elevated some of those functions to uh, the, the bureau level at the agency. Um, and so now the FCC has a bureau that's just dedicated to um, space and and the regulation of satellite services. Um, so it's an exciting time um, at the agency for uh, space regulation. Um, and one of the, several of the rationales behind the creation of this new bureau were to in ensure that the FCC was keeping pace with the um, pace of development in the satellite industry um, and enabling innovation um, in that area. Um, it's been such a huge area for change, um, and the FCC wanted to make sure that it's really staying um, staying up in terms of its ability to regulate and um, ensure that um, it's not hindering any um, applications from moving through the process uh, for satellites. So um, this is a relatively recent development, um, but I think we're all feeling really optimistic about the new Space Bureau and some of the additional resources that that will enable at the FCC in terms of its processes um, in regulating satellites. Um, and in terms of the FCC's sort of role in coordinating with other government agencies in the United States, um, we have processes both formally and informally. Um, so in terms of spectrum use for satellites and satellite systems, we coordinate uh, formally with the um, NTIA, the National Telecommunications Information Association, um, which handles the federal side of the spectrum use. Um, so we coordinate formally with that agency, and there's a memorandum of understanding between the two agencies, the FCC and the NTIA. Um, but we also have informal coordination um, for um, just general topics that we're looking at. And so in specific areas and specific applications where there's another agency that has expertise, um, staff will reach out to staff from that agency and coordinate on some of those issues, um, including um, looking at whether the other agency maybe has already has a regulatory structure that covers some of those activities. So for example, um, if the FAA uh, covers certain activities in its um, regulatory scope, um, then the FCC would discuss with the FAA and, and um, defer to that agency in terms of who the regulator would be for those activities. So there's sort of a variety of different ways in which the FCC coordinates with other agencies in the U.S. government um, as part of its uh, role in the regulation of satellites. It's interesting um, the focus that we hear from both of you on this, the, the acknowledgement and the need to be responsive to the speed of development in the commercial industry. It seems to be fairly well understood and, and looking at it as a way of creating government, not exactly known for always moving quickly, um, to, to find ways to, to do that. So that's a great point that we'll want to return to. Um, now I'm really pleased to turn to our industry representatives for this session. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Kalpak from Project Kuiper at Amazon, Yuya from Axel Space in Japan, and Manny, who is the UK Managing Director for Orbit Fab. 
Um, your all companies represent, you know, they're headquartered in three different com countries, but they also operate around the globe. And so I'd like to invite each of you to sort of share your initial thoughts on this topic, um, you know, about how government can support commercial industry, but specifically what's working, what's not working. Um, we're not interested in naming names, <laughs> um, but I'd like to share your experiences about, um, you know, do you find that different regulatory regimes have really made a difference in that particular country and have helped or hampered your operations? Um, Manny, I'll go ahead and start with you. Um, yeah, well, firstly, thank you for having uh, me on, on, on the panel and for organizing uh, such a great event. Uh, yeah, it's a very important kind of for a company that was established in the U.S., headquartered in Colorado. Um, our focus as a company is around enabling in-orbit refueling capabilities. Um, uh, what uh, Lef Lieutenant General Shaw was talking about, you know, maneuvering without regret. Uh, areas where mobility is, is key, fu fueling, we believe, refueling will be uh, really crucial for that. And um, as the panel has already uh, talked about, the complexity of some of these missions that will uh, be taking place, uh, never mind the, the normal kind of satellite operations where you have um, Earth observation applications, uh, SATCOMs, uh, scenarios where we will need to dock with assets in orbit, um, that, that gets very uh, complex very quickly. So uh, creating the right regulatory regime to enable that is, is, a, is a major challenge uh, for, for the foreseeable future. And um, you know we're we're trying to be supportive uh, of of the different working groups in in the UK as well as in the uh, my colleagues in the US are engaging on on that on those efforts. So I think having this uh, industry government kind of uh, working groups and collaboration to understand where the challenges are uh, between uh, finding that balance of. Uh, making the regulations work, but not being too prescriptive so that they hinder the end and goal. So we're, we're navigating that as we speak um, with, with the different um, working groups in, in the UK. And um, some of the challenges that we've seen really are around um, working across different kind of organizations as well, where you have, um, for example, Orbit Fab refueling uh, a, a debris removal uh, mission. What, what does that scenario look like? How, how complex is that? What are the liability implications mm -hmm. if something goes wrong? So a lot of complexity as you kind of work into the weeds of the, of the issue. And um, we're trying to, um, there's been some war gaming um, in terms of the different scenarios that might take place, how we can have the best, best outcome for, from, from a commercial standpoint where regulation isn't getting in the way. Um, what we find is that a lot of it is uh, really around ensuring um, the, the minimum headaches for a company, especially for SMEs, where we don't have a huge number of resources to allocate to resolving some of the licensing um, challenges. So really finding that balance is, is crucial. So we're trying to support where we can and um, make that happen. Um, but, but yeah, ensuring the cost isn't prohibitive and, and the process to do that isn't, isn't pro prohibitive is going to be key for us. Yeah, it's a great point about the resources that constrain, especially in your smaller companies. That you know, I, I've heard that myself saying, you know, oh, you know, Chris, we'd really like to get involved in space sustainability, but I don't even have a government affairs person on staff yet. Um, or you know, we don't always have the resources to hire a fleet of lawyers. Like We really have to be you know, careful about that. So it's a great point. Um, Kalbach, I'd like to turn to you. What, what are your thoughts on this? Is a great question. Um, first, thank you for the invitation to be part of this um, wonderful event. Uh, the fifth year of it, uh, I think it speaks for itself in terms of the importance of the issue. Uh, at Kuiper, I will say that our view on, on the role of government in, in promoting and supporting the development of the space sector has, has been extremely positive. Uh, I think there is the recognition. I've been in the satellite industry for 20 plus years. I have not seen this level of attention given by governments, basically mm -hmm. supporting tremendous investment and innovation across the industry. Uh, in every part of the industry, we have not seen this kind of support, uh, this kind of interest, this kind of investment, uh, this kind of uh, dynamism. 
And governments across the board, I think, are doing their very best to try to address um, those issues uh, and create new solutions. I think the FCC's role in, in having the new bureau, it is more than form only. It is really about taking the satellite industry and highlighting it and saying, look, we need to bring the, the chair, chair's attention to this important industry in a way that didn't really exist quite in the same way before when it was, in, when it was the International Bureau. Um, so we think that's incredibly powerful and important, and we're seeing that uh, really across the world in lots of ways. Um, the challenges, uh, I think, are worth mentioning as well, and the challenges are inherent in innovation and change. Um, that investment, that sign of success, frankly, breeds new issues to deal with, new challenges to, uh, to handle. I think space safety and sustainability is one of them. I don't want to call it a problem because I really don't think this is a problem. It is an issue for us to address and move forward on. I think industry has done a wonderful job in uh, developing best practices, working towards that, working together to find solutions, all while government is a partner bringing us in, talking to us about what we need, um, also about how our solutions meet the requirements of the day. Uh, so I think this is a really positive moment for the satellite industry writ large. Uh, I think government support is truly across the board. I think the value of the satellite industry, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but the value of the satellite industry should not be lost. It's not just what we're doing, what we did yesterday, what we're doing today, but what we're going to do tomorrow to address the requirements of mankind, I think, are, are, should be part of this discussion and debate. Yeah, absolutely. We can't, we, we can't say we have, we'll have to be good for the goodness of our heart. It's because of the value that space is creating. It's because of what we're achieving and what we're able to understand and do and the innovations and the technologies. I also liked your point about not assuming everything is a problem. Um, I used to work with a consultant who would say, treat your problems like treasures. And it was kind of that same sentiment that, you know, if you approach everything as a problem, you're gonna get one solution. But if you approach it with creativity and positivity, you might end up in a different place. And so I think that's a really interesting point. I wanna turn now to you, yeah. How, what has been Axel Space's experience here? Okay, uh, thank you, Crystal. Um, uh, it's my great honor to be part of this exciting event. So um, I'd like to uh, talk about the Japanese case. So uh, recently, um, the Japanese government has been investing a huge amount of money to nurture the commercial space industry. Uh, for example, a few years ago, uh, the annual space budget of the government was around $3 billion U.S. dollars, and it became uh, $5 billion last year. And the legislators supporting the space industry are proposing that the government secure uh, around $10 billion uh, in the near future. Um, so good thing about it uh, from the uh, space startup perspective is that the government has a strong interest and, and high expectations for uh, new space companies like um, Axel Space, uh, not just for the legacy uh, companies. And uh, we have already a, you know, been uh, financially supported by the government for some projects uh, like uh, the establishment of the way we mass manufacture the microsatellites mm -hmm and also uh, the development of the optical uh, communication terminal. And this year, uh, we won uh, the new project uh, together with the Space Compass, which is a joint venture between NDT and uh, SkyPerfect JSAT to construct the uh, data relay satellite constellation. Uh, uh, you know, and it's a huge project, uh, totaling uh, 600 million US dollars. Uh, where uh, we're going to um, develop our, uh, around 15 satellites by 2027 or 2028. Uh, uh, even in this uh, exciting situation, we still have a problem um, in Japan. The most of the, the government projects are R&D or the demonstration, um, and uh, they uh, will never be uh, never promised to be our customer of the service uh, that we are developing that we are to develop. So uh, for us, it is quite difficult uh, to have a clear image of the business. And it also means that we might not be able to have a, a solid customer base uh, at the beginning, um, which uh, you know, leads to the difficulties uh, of getting strategic investment from the venture capital or 
the other you know, financial institutions. Um, so um, if the Japan, Japanese government wants uh, private uh, space companies to scale their business globally, um, they need to play a new role. I mean, uh, they, uh, the government as a user of the service uh, that space companies are to develop. Again, so we like the government to be a big and stable customer of our service. So um, next, I'd like to uh, talk about the regulations. Uh, when we started our business uh, back in 2008, um, there were no regulations that cover the commercial space activities. It, it, it's because uh, the, almost all the space activities were managed by JAXA uh, or its uh, former agencies. Uh, but after we succeeded in a big fundraise in 2015, uh, other space uh, startups uh, followed uh, to, to boost their you know, uh, unique uh, uh, space activities. So in response to this uh, situation, the Japanese government enacted two uh, new uh, laws, which are the Space Activities Act and Satellite Remote Sensing Act. Uh, and uh, uh, the government did, and when uh, they make these uh, regulations, they uh, did the research um, of the equivalent laws in other uh, countries like the US, Europe, and they also um, interviewed uh, space companies so that they don't, they, they're not, they're trying not to make it, uh, uh, you know, uh, hinder uh, the space activities in the private sector. So I think that's why uh, we never faced uh, uh, critical uh, regulatory issues uh, in the past. So of course, um, there um, is a, a review process of the government uh, when we want to launch a satellite, but transparency is secured in that process. So we can you know, pass it uh, as long as we you know, satisfy the uh, requirements um, that are you know, explicitly described. So that's a Japanese situation. Well, thank you. It's it's really interesting to, to hear you know, the different ways to view government as the regulator, but also as the customer. And, and so actually, you kind of teed me up perfectly for my, for my next question to Ray, which is, um, you know, as we heard yesterday from Rebecca Everdeen and from Julie Black, the UK has really made it a priority to directly invest in industry, particularly in, in the space sustainability area. Um, you know, tell us more about why this approach was the one that you've taken, you know, especially from a direct investment perspective. You know, how are you doing this? You know, I've even seen reports uh, recently that, that um, the UK has received 17% of, of global space private capital since 2015, which makes it um, a, one of the highest in, in the world. You know, why do you think that is? And, and, and you know, what is your, your thinking about how you're using your dollars, or in this case, pounds? <laughs> Wisely, I like to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think what's really changed in the past couple of years is the development of a really solid national space strategy. Now, we've had strategies before in the UK about space, and uh, apologies to my DC colleagues in the audience, um, but they were basically the old strategies retitled for the current year and then pushed out again. <laughs> But the, the, the current st space strategy we are, are working to was developed from the ground up by, by consultation, that word again, but it was so important to, to do that, and a, a lot of effort internally across governments. So it wasn't just the space agency, it was across all of the departments about what is needed for the UK to deliver societal benefits and economic growth, and that coalesced into that national space strategy. And then from that, uh, and, and in that, was a, a commitment or an aspiration, I should say, to be a world leader in sustainability and support sustainability as, as a driver for growth going forward and also uh, to, a, a way for the UK to, to demonstrate its commitment to its, its liability. We, we want to uh, be a, a large-scale satellite operator. I believe we are the, the second or maybe the third or one of the two. Um, it, but an awful lot of satellites are based out of the UK and operated from the UK. So we, we have a, a responsibility to, you know, as, as, a, as a nation state. We are potentially liable, um, although that is a minefield by itself, but we have responsibilities there on, on that, um, that issue. So the National Space Strategy committed us to sustainability, and, and that has really been a, a, a huge catalyst. Like I, I've been in the, uh, the Space Agency for, for 12 years now. Um, we've had a direction of travel which, as I said, was last year's direction of travel, retitled for the current year's direction of travel. But this really has given us extreme focus, so much so, as, as Julia mentioned in the keynote yesterday, 
We've restructured the space agency. So we have uh, uh, my, my position. We have Julie's position. We have a team for sustainability. And that has allowed us to give a, a really solid focus on where we prioritise our money for sustainability. Because before, many different sections, Earth observation, space science, uh, GPS type activity, all very important. But sustainability was kind of smeared through. It was in there. Nobody was really responsible. It was hard to pick out. It was hard to give focus. It was hard to have a coherent strategy for. Now we're getting there. Now we've got priority. We have a, a plan by Minister George Freeman, plan for sustainability. We have to go report to him a week after this conference about our progress on said plans. So we've been held to account on the activities which we're um, um, committed to. Uh, that's kicked off a range of new activities and new funding just for sustainability as well. So all of that activity, all of that uh, political focus, the realisation that the, the, the UK wants to be a leader in sustainability, explicitly focused, has, has really given us a, a laser-like precision on where we're spending our money. Uh, and that's committed us to the, the regulation work, the consultation work, the improving of the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, an engagement for uh, um, the, the space community to be involved in developing that regulation to, to grow the sector sustainably, as well as developing things like uh, the, the standards work. And it was really good to see yesterday in the pitch uh, the, the fact that the standards in the, in the poll came out as one of the top drivers for helping the space community. We've got a, a large focus we've kicked off on that, um, uh, Earth Space Sustainability Initiative, it's got the acronym right. Uh, that's, that will be led by UK government and the community to develop a set of voluntary standards. So we don't have to produce tons and tons and tons of regulation. We have the voluntary standards which people want to uh, adhere to and, and, uh, and apply into their business models, a you know, full life cycle uh, application of, of, of those standards into their business models, as well as the, the, the regulation approach which sits alongside. So we, like I said, we've, we've kicked off those activities and the work we're doing on the technology development is absolutely linked to those activities. So the work we're doing on enabling technologies, raising TRL, the, raise, uh, the work we're doing on um, IOSM, looking at things like refueling, looking at things like ADR, factor that in right from the start so we have a coherent approach all the way through. So we don't have a disconnect, or we don't have a, a situation where we develop a, a, a space mission to remove, say, a non-UK registered object, and then we find the whole thing sits on the launch pad or in a container for three years because we need to then speak to any other nation state and work out the, uh, the, the, the regulatory aspects of, of capturing a, a non-UK based, based object. Because of course, one person's salvage or um, um, servicing mission is another nation's piracy uh, unless you get the regulations right and the and agreements in place. And you know, it's sometimes seen as a bit of a dry subject, sometimes seen as a bit of, uh, you know, that the regulation sale sits on the side as a periphery, but I think we've recognised in the agency the, the, the regulation sale, and the same with the, our DSIC colleagues, is embedded all the way through. Um, we've got a, uh, I suppose the Americans would call it a candy, we call it a stick of rock, it's a uh, kind of a solid sugary type object, and it normally has some writing, and it's all the way through. You can break bits of this candy off in the writing. Is, you, can, you can't get rid of it. It's, it's, it's embedded in. And that's how we see regulation with our technology programs, with our approach, with our policy. It's absolutely embedded in. It's not a, a, a side aspect. And that's how, hopefully, we get to an answer to your question about how we focus our money, our pounds, as uh, wisely as an, and as efficiently as possible. I commend you for working space piracy into your remarks. <laughs> um, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. I'd actually like to ask Manny to respond directly. I mean, my understanding is that OrbitFab's office in the UK is actually maybe about a year old. You know, what compelled the company to make these decisions? You know, are there aspects of the regulatory environment in the UK that, that really led you to that decision? Yeah, I um, kind of use a, one of my uh, uh, favorite quotes on this. Um, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. I believe it was Charlie Munger who said that. But really, um, the UK Space Agency kind of drove uh, the incentive for us to establish uh, in the UK by having in the UK ADR program from the outset the concept of refurbishable spacecraft. So in the original requirements, um, the mission to remove two or more objects 
had an, an additional requirement, which was the spacecraft itself should be refurbishable. So they, they weren't being prescriptive about, oh, it needs to be refuelable, it needs to be this, but they said it needs to be refurbishable. And this kind of plays into the, making the spacecraft go beyond its initial uh, intended uh, life. So um, the, the different consortium members went for refueling, and uh, that was a key impetus for us to establish our, our, um, our office in the UK, and given our focus is, is, is on refueling. And we want to support the growing ecosystem around that. We believe uh, it's all about working with partners across, across the industry to enable that to work. Um, and you know, we work with propulsion providers, as well as uh, spacecraft uh, bus um, providers and operators to understand what are the um, what what can we do to in, embed some of these capabilities into into those um, um, systems, and um, that's where kind of our uh, Rafti interface evolved was taking those requirements and ensuring it can meet the widest uh, array of parameters and 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 so it's led to more than a hundred spacecraft. Uh, adopting that as a as a baseline into their design, so the way we approach standards in, is is you know kind of ensuring adoption is key. Yeah. Um, if you if you enforce standards that don't in the end, no one wants to adopt, then it's kind of pointless. I, I always think of that XKCD um, a graphic where it's like 14 standards, and then someone comes along and says, "Oh, we don't." We don't have a. We have too many standards. We need one to rule them all, and then 15 <laughs> standards at the end of that. It's like, yeah, w w the way we approached it is like let's minimize the barriers to adoption and um, and and ensure that you know no constraints. What are, what are the swap C uh, impact on their spacecraft? So, uh, kind of all of that to say that um, the UK has kept this um, approach of welcoming approach of, of uh, companies like us mm -hmm. who. Um, are focused on, on these capabilities. And, and we, we really appreciate the nimble kind of um, uh, UK uh, regulatory landscape, always constantly thinking about how do we improve the regulatory environment to support the different, um, the next generation of space capabilities. And so, yeah, that, that's one of the key drivers for us to establish in the UK. I just want to say my regulation panel is winning in the internal competition for pop culture references. <laughs> um, thank you, Manny. That's, it's really helpful, especially given that your business is, is, a, is a space company, but it is a, what I, I personally call like the sustainability space companies. Um, and so it's interesting to hear that, that symbiotic relationship that you're describing. Um, I want to turn back to, to Marissa now. Um, the FCC has made some really big changes in the last couple of years to create new or smoother licensing paths um, for emerging technologies and, and to encourage um, mitigating orbital debris impacts. You know, can you talk about how the, you approach the balance that we've been talking about here, this, this support for innovation and sustainability, but also the requirements in need to, you know, what was the, what was the driving thinking there? Sure. So I think, you know, and this all goes back to the, the idea of um, supporting innovation in, in the satellite industry and in <coughs> space. Um, and the FCC has taken a number of actions over the last several years, as, as you're mentioning. Um, we updated our rules for uh, to create a new licensing process uh, specific to small satellites that met certain criteria. So creating sort of a streamlined approach um, where as long as the applicant could satisfy criteria, then they would have uh, mm -hmm. faster application processing times, um, lower fees in many instances. And so that was one area where um, I think the FCC was looking at um, a category of operations that had were easier to review, had perhaps lower risks in some respects um, as compared to other operations, and created a streamlined process for that set of um, operations. And I think that's been working very well over the last uh, few years since it's been adopted by the agency. Um, the FCC has also been um, working on a number of other initiatives um, in the streamlining area, including just sort of a look at generally how to streamline our licensing processes for um, operators, um, whether that be in uh, the time frame aspect or if there are 
um, rules that we have that maybe don't make sense anymore in certain ways. And so that's an ongoing um, activity at the FCC. We um, published, a, or the FCC adopted a notice of proposed rulemaking, looking at some of those topics back um, in the fall of 2023. Um, and we're continuing to work on those issues um, in the new Space Bureau and, and look at some of those um, topics as we've had comments come in from, uh, from industry in a lot of those areas. Um, in the orbital debris space, um, the FCC has been um, undertaking an uh, update to its regulations for orbital debris over the last several years. Um, the FCC's first rules for orbital debris um, were actually adopted back in 2004. Um, and then in 2020, the FCC took a look back um, at those um, regulations, made a number of updates at that time, and also published a further notice of proposed rulemaking, seeking additional comment in, in many areas, including um, several topics with respect to large constellations, um, maneuverability, things along those lines. Um, and then last year, the FCC actually adopted um, an update um, that implemented what is kind of colloquially called the five-year rule. Um, so for commercial satellites that are licensed by the FCC um, or have market access to the U.S. Uh, through a market access grant from the FCC, um, those satellites uh, that are in LEO um, will need to have a plan to deorbit within five years following the conclusion of their mission. Um, and so <laughs> that was, um, that was a, a fairly big update. Um, to, to the FCC's rules. Um, there, there is a grandfathering period for that, so enabling um, operators who already have plans to launch satellites. You know, there's, so there's a two-year period from the date of the adoption, so um, that'll be in the fall of, of 2024 um, when that becomes effective in that way. But um, So that was an exciting update for us, and, and there's still a lot of work to be done, I think, in the area of orbital debris regulatory updates, and we're continuing to look at, at those. Um, and in so doing, are looking at ways to um, to find that balance between um, you know making sure that the regulations fit the set of operations that are being contemplated. Um, and I think one of the ways you know to look at that is maybe creating um, categorizing systems in certain ways um, that make the regulations make sense for those systems. Um, mm -hmm. One of the other areas that the FCC is looking at right now um, is in the area of in-space servicing, assembly and manufacturing, or ISAM. Um, there was a notice of inquiry released last year by the agency, um, and we, we got a large number of comments that came in um, in that proceeding, um, and we're looking at those now and assessing whether there are any updates we can make to our rules to mm -hmm. facilitate those sorts of activities, which, um, again, um, trying to keep pace with innovation in the area and also ensure that um, our regulations are a good fit for um, what's out there right now in the industry. Oh, don't worry. There are lots of questions online about the five-year rule. So I appreciate <laughs> I didn't even have to ask some of them that you, you got in there and you went right there. So really appreciate that because I was waiting through which one I was going to ask. Um, but you, you've handled that. So... I want to turn to, to CalPAC, um, and there are questions about you know, whether very large constellations are moving out ahead of the current regulatory environment. It's a pretty hot button issue in some ways. I just want to kind of give you the opportunity um, to address that and to say, you know, are there, is there regulatory uncertainty that you would like to see rectified you know, as a company um, with uh, one of the, the newer models um, in space right now? No, I think that's a, it's a great question uh, for any company, large, small, um, new, old. What you look for in regulation is, at the end of the day, transparency, clarity, consistency. Um, that allows investment. It's particularly important in the space sector, where the investments are so large, uh, they're also so long term. Uh, when we're building a constellation, in Amazon's case, we committed when we got our license uh, to at least a $10 billion investment to go make Project Kuiper happen. We are well on the way to go make that happen. And in fact, I think we've, we've pretty much said it's going to be more than $10 billion. Uh, that's what it takes to bring the kind of value proposition that we think Kuiper helps bring. Uh, and before answering the broader question about moving ahead, I, I don't want to lose uh, the, the connection to what is the value proposition that satellites bring. We've heard this uh, over the last couple of days. 
satellites are an integral part of our lives globally. Every person in this world almost is touched by satellites in some way, shape, or form. We all lived through COVID. Um, COVID exposed the criticality of broadband connection to making our lives go forward. There are still 2.73 billion people on Earth who have little to no connection. We think satellite systems like Kuiper are gonna help bridge that digital divide. I'm not telling you we're gonna do it alone. In fact, we can't do it alone. We're gonna do it with others, other technology, to go narrow that, that gap. But the idea that somehow we should put a pause on the deployment of these satellite services is frankly fanciful. Not going to happen. The world is moving forward, uh, and it should move forward. I think governments are doing a really good job of exploring the, the issues associated with large deployments, um, but industry is not standing alone or standing apart. Industry is actively coming together to develop best practices for how such large constellations, and not just large constellations, but all operators in low Earth orbit can coexist, uh, can thrive together. And I think that's all part of the storyline that has to be captured here. Nobody is more incentivized than large constellations, I will say point blank, than us for space safety and sustainability. When you invest over $10 billion to build an infrastructure in space, you are not creating it in an environment where you think you are at risk because um, of bad behavior by yourself or others. That behavior we heard in earlier panels today, the debris that could be created is debris unlike what happens on the ground. That debris lasts and could last for generations. Um, so we are incredibly incentivized to control our own behavior and ensure safety, mm -hmm. ensure um, both safety in terms of launch, safety in terms of design and operations, safety in terms of deorbit. And for Kuiper, we have done all of that. We picked our low Earth orbit around 600 kilometers for that very reason. Being at that lower side of LEO, even in uh, events of problems with our satellites, these satellites naturally deorbit fairly quickly. Uh, we do robust testing on our satellites. Each of our satellites are some of the most complicated, most technologically advanced satellites up there today. Um, and these are not disposable. We didn't launch them to be disposable. We care about the, the value proposition. We care about the reliability of these spacecraft. Uh, and that's so much a part of what we're doing. So the idea that, that large constellations are somehow moving ahead of regulation, I think they're moving in partnership. I think they're moving with partnership with industry as well as with government. More work needs to be done. I think the FCC made some really interesting and good decisions uh, when applications come in front of them for very large um, uh, very large constellation licensing, and the FCC said, well, wait a second. We want this to go forward, but we want this to go forward in a measured basis. So they gave a portion of the license for that, space, that entity's spacecraft in an effort to continue to allow the innovation to go forward while still doing it in a measured way, still evaluating what the safety issues are, because the FCC knows it's not a question of one applicant. Once you grant the license to the one applicant for a constellation of that size, you're essentially saying that's, generally speaking, okay for potential future entrants. So they, they had to take that approach. I love that kind of um, proactive way to allow industry to move forward, but do it safely. Thank you. There's a lot in there. I don't know that I can unpack it quite just yet. I do also want to have a conversation quickly about another type of licensing. So you, you work on remote sensing licensing, which is a very different thing. What's your experience? What's your learning curve in setting up Axel Globe? And then you know, taking that internationally as, as you sell around the world, you know, what's your view on remote sensing licensing regimes? So thank you. So in Japan, uh, uh, you know, um, the remote sensing business is regulated by the uh, Satellite Remote Sensing Act that I mentioned earlier. Um, we need a license only if we provide a very, very high resolution uh, images, say uh, 
20 uh, 25 centimeters or better. So uh, in that case, the also user also needs a, a license. So this is very strict rule because uh, uh, you know uh, if uh, such uh, very high resolution uh, data are you know uh, distributed with uh, freely, um, they may you know um, the give the uh, huge uh, bad impact on the national mm -hmm. security. And so um, if we we don't need a license if we provide a data uh, images uh, whose resolution is between 25 centimeters and two meters. Although we need to manage the uh, strictly manage the end user list. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we are providing the 2.5 meter resolution, so uh, there are no special restrictions imposed on us. But in the near future, we plan to have our uh, high resolution images. So we need to start learning uh, a lot of things from the, uh, the government uh, through the cross communication with them. Uh, of course, we need to do some spectrum coordination. Uh, internationally, when we you know launch our satellites, and, but we have uh, much experience on that, and uh, but it, it is nothing with uh, not, it, it is uh, nothing to do with the real sensing. Hmm. Yep. So we're lucky at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> like that, we're lucky at the moment. Um, I I don't want to. I want to turn to audience questions now. Um, I'm going to. To pull moderator's privilege and combine a couple of these because they're touching on some of the same topics. So we talk about, as governments and, and industry are talking about today, about how do we create this environment that a lot of times the first question is, you know, one here calls it, you know, how do we avoid a race to the bottom? How do we avoid venue shopping? Um, another person put it as, you know, what is the knee in the curve where regulation can actually drive something offshore? So I want to I want to try to address this a little bit directly and just say to, to, to whoever wants to, to take this on, you know, where are the cautions? Where are the concerns in this area? You know, how do you how do you respond to the idea that if you do too much or too little, that you can you can do exactly the opposite of what you're trying to do, which is meet your responsibilities, ensure safe safe and stable space, but also support innovation. So, where do you see the pain points on this issue? I'll open it up. I'll jump in first to say, Great. I think follow the science is the mm -hmm. the beginning of this. Uh, we are still really in the early phases of learning. Uh, about operations in LEO to maximize and really value safety. And, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm, I'm saying there are better techniques of, uh, of managing operations. I've said this in other forums, but think about it as building a highway. And if you have no rules on the highway, uh, what, is the, what is the capacity of that highway to handle traffic safely? Uh, as you develop best practices and, and approaches to operating safely, I think you, you can really maximize uh, the overall utilization safely mm -hmm. of that resource. And I think that's kind of where we are. Where, um, the question is, can governments go too far? Well, look, if they focus on the science, tie it to um, really where... where uh, the academic and scientific and industry research tells you uh, are the requirements and really delivering um, greater safety outcomes, I think industry is going to be right there with you because I, I don't want to create this perception that it's an industry against government, industry against safety. That is generally not what's going on, as I said before. We are investing, not just Amazon, but industry writ large is investing billions and billions of dollars uh, to deploy assets in space. We have a strong desire to ensure safety. I think one of the things government can do is look at what kind of requirements, again, looking at the best practices that are out there. Where do you require maneuverability? Uh, at what altitude does that make sense? What other requirements are going to be um, make greater sense mm -hmm. at higher orbits to enable this kind of innovation to continue? Sure. Ray or Marissa, I mean, what do you, how do you approach this? How do you, are you worried? Are you worried about um, driving innovation somewhere else? Uh, y yes and no. I suppose there's, there's, there's two extremes, isn't there? You can have a, uh, a regulation regime which is so lax, you license anything. <laughs> With, with no real due care or consideration, or you have the other spectrum where your regulation regime is so tough that um, you're not an attractive place and you, you stifle your own industry. Uh, the the points, points you made about working together for the benefit of both, I think we're seeing very much so. 
um, and, and the, the, the people we talk to, the people we consult with, are, are very keen that the, they are seen to be doing the right thing, regardless. Um, that helps their investors. We had a panel yesterday on, on ESG. So there's a, there's a lot of people who are starting to be very, very careful with the investment they, they make into, uh, into private companies. Uh, they want to make sure their investments are going to, into a safe, sustainable, responsible company who, who operates in, 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 a, in a socially responsible way. And of course, space sustainability is socially responsible as well as uh, promoting economic benefit for the operators as well. So for, for us, we have to decide where we sit and what we accept, both as uh, the standards, and if people do not want to apply to those standards, we have to accept that they will leave our shores and go somewhere else. But you know, they're the standards that we as a nation want, want to be kept to. And it also applies as well, a little bit of a stick as well as, well as carrot, what services we accept into the UK. So if, if, you want, if you're a satellite operator and you, um, I won't name any countries, but a license in perhaps a, a state where the licensing regime is potentially questionable, do you accept their services into your territory? Because that can, can make a, a, a big effect on the, a, a, an operator's business model if they can't supply you with, with service. So it, it's finding that balance. Um, okay. Where we are on that spectrum, we're, we're still deciding. Some of the consultation work we're doing will, will, will help us get there, but uh, it's certainly something we're thinking about. Great. Any other thoughts? I'll just add to, to add on to, to that. Um, I think at the FCC, we're, um, and I think this is demonstrated by the creation of the Space Bureau, we're really interested in promoting um, innovation and U.S. leadership in, in um, the space industry. And um, I think one of the areas um, that we also look at in terms of our um, regulation is how we treat um, applicants for U.S. market access to the United States. And we do look at the same um, the same information uh, for applicants for U.S. market access as we do for those um, companies seeking to have a U.S. license. So that's one area where, um, again, just um, going to some of the points that you were making, um, we also assess um, satellites or satellite systems um, that are authorized in other jurisdictions and look at some of the um, orbital debris mitigation issues uh, potentially associated with those systems as well uh, to the extent that they want to communicate with the U.S. market. Excellent. All right. So one of you in the audience has kindly given me the perfect closing question because we have <laughs> just about five minutes left. Um, and it was actually something we were thinking about before. So, you know, given the opportunity, you know, we're, let, let's talk a little more theoretically here. And, you know, we, we titled this Help Not Hinder. So I particularly love this. Um, you know, what is one regulation or I'll, I'll broaden a little and say one area where you think we, we, we really could um, create more certainty um, that you would that you would suggest, and it doesn't have to be for your country. Again, this is let's be a little hypothetical here. You know, within the next 12 months to help not hinder. You know, where do you think some of these pain points are, or, or where more action is needed? Um, if it's all right, I will start. Um, we'll just start here with Ray, and we'll just work our way down the line. Ooh, be careful what I say with the colleagues in the audience. Um, doesn't have to be for the UK. <laughs> I, I personally, I, I think that uh, where we could really help is the interaction between a UK registered asset or service with a, 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 a target, for instance, from an, another country. How, how to give clarity on regulations, to, to help give some, some direction to those who uh, potentially, you know, the UK wants to be responsible, and, but we, we have a, a limited number of satellites compared to others. So the ability to, to operate across borders in space safely um, without any regulatory difficulties, I think that would be a, a great thing to achieve if that could be done in the next 12 months. All right. Go back. Boy, you're putting me in a hot spot because, as I said before, I think a lot of what's happening out there that probably the most impactful is in the area of best practices. Mm -hmm. I think um, what was said yesterday by uh, a colleague of yours um, was it's an experimental ground. What's, what industry is creating uh, through these best practices is really allowing everyone, all of us, to learn better about how to move towards space safety. I think one of the areas that, that is um, useful to look at 
potentially on a regulatory basis, but maybe in a best practices uh, perspective, is that a propulsion? Mm -hmm. Looking at maneuver, I shouldn't say propulsion, let me, let me make it technology <laughs> neutral. Maneuverability, but maneuverability with an outcome mm -hmm. uh, capability. I think looking at that and saying at what altitude is that required, uh, based on a lot of different factors out there to ensure long-term sustainability, I think that is a, an area that government should look at. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so um, just I wanted to announce that you know we uh, uh, released our green spacecraft standard just a few days ago. Uh, we're it is company standard, but you know uh, we're trying to uh, secure the sustainability not only in the space but on the ground. So uh, we want to care about all the you know uh, uh, activities on the ground in space. So uh, you know uh, the uh, standard is available on our website, so please take a look later. And we'd like to have uh, discussions with uh, other industry players so that we can make it more effective and uh, uh, even uh, possibly uh, evolve it into our industry standard. So, um, you know, uh, what we're, um, you know, uh, concerned about is that there is uh, a ongoing uh, discussions about the space traffic management and also uh, the DO bidding. And uh, our business might uh, be damaged severely if uh, you know, new regulations um, that might be difficult for us to cope with are suddenly introduced. So um, uh, we are continue, you know, uh, we continue carefully watching uh, the ongoing discussion in the industry, but we also um, would like the government uh, to be involved in such discussions, uh, which are sometimes G2G, um, and uh, to share uh, the acquired information uh, among us, um, you know, uh, in a real-time manner. So um, we need to have more, you know, uh, discussions about uh, space traffic management. Uh, I, I don't know how, you know, would, you know, such kind of discussions would affect our activities. So we need to have more uh, certainty on that point. So we'd like to work with the government. Excellent, Manny. If you were god of regulation, what would you do? Um, well, I, I would do everything I could to focus on, on speed in terms of the licensing process. Uh, companies, in kind of competitive uh, advantage is, you know, how quickly can innovate? What is the innovation cycle? And if there's uh, a month, month's delay or every month of delay that there is in getting the asset into orbit and generating revenue is a month less revenue, for a, a month less uh, runway for a startup or a small company. So, um, you know, if, 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 if there is a cap opportunity to improve on the speed of that licensing process, I think that, that should be the focus area. And I'm, I'm not saying you compromise um, the, the, the considerations that w we need to ensure are embedded in that. I think you can have both worlds um, through automation, through a number of other uh, avenues that can be incorporated into the licensing process. And, uh, yeah, I would encourage focusing on that. Excellent. Marissa, you have the last word. <laughs> All right. Um, so I, the FCC has a, a number of different things that we're looking at right now in terms of regulatory updates. Um, I would say one issue that is perhaps cross-cutting across many of those proceedings and I think is something that um, will be a focus uh, for the, the new Bureau is uh, transparency mm -hmm. um, and the way in which um, we can help um, provide information. And, and that can take a lot of different forms in terms of transparency. But I think that, that may be an area of focus for us. Um, going forward, and I think an important one, um, and particularly to make sure that uh, new entrants are getting the information that they need um, about what their obligation, their regulatory obligations are. So that's, I think, one area um, for continued work. Excellent. Well, that's what I want to hear. All right, everyone. I also have the. I have two wonderful things I get to do right now. I want to thank my panelists. Um, I was really excited to have this conversation. It's not often that we get to stay on public together as government and industry and, and try to talk through some of these issues. And so thank you all for being willing to have this conversation. I think for really providing some thoughtful comments and, and food for thought for our audience. So thank you very much for joining me today.